on their phones just a short time ago, the warning reading, quote, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Well, about 35 minutes after the alert was sent out, Hawaii Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard confirmed the warning was fake. Hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Wright. And I'm Laura Engel. Hawaii emergency officials say the alert was, in fact, an error, but it's unclear how or why it was sent out. Hawaii has been beefing up security measures amid rising nuclear threats with North Korea. The state tested its warning sirens last year for the first time since the Cold War. The White House official says that President Trump has been briefed on the state of Hawaii's emergency exercise, adding this was purely a state exercise, Kelly. Well, let's bring in Phil Keating, who's live from Mar-a-Lago, where the president is this weekend. Phil? Kelly, President Trump was still at his Trump International Golf Club just down the street, wrapping up about four, four and a half hours of golfing this morning. And when Afterwards, now that he is back at Mar-a-Lago on Palm Beach, uh, the word came out that this false alarm came from the state of Hawaii's Emergency Operations Center, and we now have a statement per a White House official. I will quote to you, this is not a tweet directly from the president. Quote, the president has been briefed on the state of Hawaii's emergency management exercise. This was purely a state exercise. And the U.S. Pacific commander, David Benham, out there in Hawaii, also released a statement saying no ballistic missile threat was there and that the earlier message was actually sent in error. 38 long minutes actually went by before the first alert went out to all Hawaiian residents that an incoming missile was detected, take cover, take shelter. And then finally, 38 minutes later, the false alarm was announced. So for everybody on the islands of Hawaii, certainly a frantic and panic-filled 38 minutes. Uh, if the president does have any further statements today, of course, we'll bring it right to you. Uh, but the president and the White House seeming to emphasize that this was a state operation, not a federal operation, and that it all rests with Hawaii right now to remedy exactly how this false alarm emanated out in the first place. The president golfing today, as I mentioned, with U.S. Trade Ambassador Richard Lighthizer, and they reportedly spoke about China, trade as well as NAFTA. Again, once the president returned in his motorcade back to Mar-a-Lago, that is when wind came out about this false alarm in Hawaii. And we just now, minutes ago, received the first comment from the White House. Basically, the president has been briefed. He's on it. The White House is on it. And an emphasis that this was not a federal emergency operation or exercise. This was a state of Hawaii one. Kelly? Yeah, and Phil, uh, that would go in hand with what we're hearing from Hawaii, the governor of Hawaii also stating that he regrets that this was a false alarm and he is looking into the matter along with Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard as well as the senator representing Hawaii and, and other representatives are all looking into what happened here and calling it out as being human error. And the military was quick to point out that this was a false alarm. So. Whatever happened on a state level, we're still waiting to hear some official word from the governor of the state. Yeah, clearly they're still investigating and also equally clear this is about as bad of a situation as you can have not only in Hawaii, but also California, Oregon, Washington and Alaska, all of the states that would be nearest to North Korea. Everybody's been basically on pins and needles at all five states emergency operations center ever since Kim Jong-un really began ramping up his missile tests and threatening uh, to eventually get something perhaps as close as Guam or perhaps to the U.S. mainland. So uh, to send out uh, what turns out to be a false alarm and really uh, get many, many families and people on the islands uh, in full panic mode that here comes everything we've been fearing for weeks, that it's a false alarm. Uh, you certainly hope they still take it seriously if there ever is a legitimate alarm in the future. Yeah, so. and one would, one would anticipate that as the president finds out more information about what happened, that uh, he might wade into the waters, particularly the, given the fact that on our air moments ago, uh, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard 
uh, actually asked him to get uh, involved in the situation as it relates to North Korea. Uh, be that as it may, we'll continue to follow the developments of what's happening in Hawaii, and we thank you for the updates from uh, the, the Sunshine White House. <laughs> thank you. Let's have a little smile today. Thanks, okay, Phil. thanks, Kelly. All right. All right, and as we're all trying to get down to the bottom of exactly what happened, why it happened, we want to play you some sound that we have from the Hawaiian governor saying it was, in fact, a wrong button that was pushed. Listen. Good morning. Early this morning, an error was made and a false alarm was sent um, to cell phones and to TV and radio. Um, we investigated, and as soon as we became aware that it was an error, we uh, took action to uh, send the notification that it was a false alarm. You know, this uh, should not have happened. We are investigating the sequence of events that occurred. Uh, an error was made in um, emergency management, um, which allowed this um, false alarm to be sent. And that was the governor of Hawaii uh, giving us a statement there. Uh, you can only imagine, you know, what's happening with the person who hit that button. Let's go ahead and bring in Brian Yenis, who's been following this story for us. Hi, Brian. Hi, Laura. I think it's important that we, we kind of put this in, in perspective here. The Hawaii Emergency Management Agency has about a 30-slide uh, presentation that's on their website and it's called emergency preparedness and in that it goes details into what would happen if there were to be a nuclear uh, attack on on Hawaii from North Korea. If we pull up this slide, just to give people an idea, remember there were 38 minutes between when that message was sent and when it was a correction that was sent that it was a false alarm. But look, the launch to impact only takes 20 minutes from North Korea to Hawaii, and this is the process in which it's supposed to happen uh, if, in, if there were ever to be a launch. Uh, the U.S. Pacific Command in Hawaii sends a message to the state warning point, which is the Hawaii Emergency Preparedness. They then, in the first five minutes, are then, uh, you know, there's defenses that are sent, notifications are sent, and then between five and ten minutes, the sirens go off, an emergency uh, alert system goes off on the televisions and the radio and on the phone, and within ten to twenty minutes of that launch, that is when folks are supposed to take action. And I think it's important here to realize just just how little time people have in the event of something like this. So for 38 minutes to have gone by, given the fact that there's only really 10 to 15 minutes for people to actually build into this, for people to actually to, to respond to a ballistic missile, um, is scary to say the least. I think it's also important to reiterate and underscore the point that we've heard from, um, from representatives and senators from Hawaii who say that, look, they only have minutes to take action and that there are no designated blast or fallout shelters in Hawaii at all. There's no federal funding for them. And so when people are told to take action, it is quite literally the Hawaii preparedness plan for people to stay indoors, stay away from windows. If you're driving, to pull off to the side and go into a nearby building or literally to lay flat on the ground. And I think, again, that is the official emergency management plan if and if something like this were to happen. I think it's also important to note that part of the Hawaii's emergency plan is a monthly siren test um, that's supposed to occur the first working day of every month at 1145 in the morning. And look, the, what we've heard from the White House um, was that the White House says that this was something that was planned. Um, by the state that this was purely a state exercise but the only thing we've we've been able to find in terms of something that is clearly planned is a statewide siren test and even when that happens that is something that's given with notification people know that a test is going to happen it is an alert that's sent out for 50 seconds it pauses for 10 seconds and then the alarm goes off for 50 seconds so what i'm trying to say is though when the state do, when the state does have a monthly test on its sirens it's planned out people know what's going to happen at the first of every month it lasts for about a little over two minutes it doesn't last for 38 minutes and um, a frightening amount of time given that people are told that a launch to impact only takes 20 minutes. So I think a, a lot of people are, have their eyes open right now as to the lack of, they have the plan, but the lack of options that are for people in the advent of a 
of a possible ballistic missile attack. We're also seeing tweets from people. Uh, John Peterson, who is in, who was in Hawaii, he says that in reaction to uh, receiving this uh, incredible message on his phone, under he says, quote, under mattresses in the bathtub with my wife, baby, and in-laws, please, Lord, let this bomb threat not be real. Another person uh, tweeted, uh, Jillian, sheltered in place in our bathroom with our pets, but I was sobbing the whole time trying to get East Coast family on the phone. And we have a tweet also from Brian Schatz, uh, who is uh, a senator in Hawaii. Again, false alarm. What happened today is totally inexcusable. The whole state was terrified. There needs to be tough and quick accountability and a fixed process. So obviously uh, a scare, but I think more questions right now as to this state exercise that the White House is saying that the state was going through some sort of exercise. We can see that with the siren tests that there have always been um, some sort of notice about those tests. In this case, Clearly, something went way, way off and way wrong here, and I think there's going to be a lot more questions moving forward. Brian, when you bring up what exactly the plan is supposed to be for the fine folks of Hawaii and those visiting, uh, just the idea that the plan is to lay flat on the ground, get away from the windows, uh, you're right. You bring up a lot of really important issues that you found there uh, with the state of Hawaii. Thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention. We'll continue to follow that part of the story as well. Brian Yenis for us in our New York newsroom. Kelly. Well, let's bring in international security expert Jim Walsh, who is going to talk to us about one thing, and it turns out we, we have to talk about this Hawaii situation. Jim, as an international security expert, uh, what do you make of this, yeah. this big oops? Well, Kelly, I, I've actually had opinions about this for a while. First, when the Japanese started doing drills, and then when Hawaii announced that they were going to do drills, I never thought this was a very good idea. The why? U.S. used to have why, civil defense. Why, why was it not a good robust? idea? Because there's no defense against a nuclear weapon. You know, as your last report suggested, laying down on the ground is not going to do anything to prevent you from being killed by a nuclear weapon. I, we used to have a big civil defense program in the U.S. We abandoned it because it just didn't make any sense because there was no defense against nuclear weapons. And uh, there are consequences when you do have civil defense. You know, uh, hopefully everyone in Hawaii is going to get through this fine, but there may be people who have health emergencies as a result of this. There may be people who suffer psychological injury, you know, children or expectant mothers or those with pre-existing mental health conditions. I mean, there are real consequences to scaring the hell out of people, and I just don't think it's going to matter. I mean, if there was a nuclear attack, there's nothing Hawaiians could do that would change that outcome. All right, so what can Hawaiians do for that matter, as we heard from Phil Keating? What can people in Alaska, California, Oregon, uh, Washington, all of those places that would be within range of any kind of uh, uh, potential attack or possible attack, as we've heard from the threatening regime of North Korea? Yeah, there's nothing you can do. I mean, that's. I, I, I know that's a message people don't want to hear, but that has been true since the beginning of the nuclear age. Well, let me back you that know, up. Uh, what can we do? Okay, let, let me interrupt you one minute. Let, let me interrupt you one and minute, Jim. You know, there's not, they're, they're, so, they're, they're so explosive on a scale that people don't appreciate. You know, look at those pictures yeah. from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Jim, Jim, I, Jim I get leveled. that. I, 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 uh, so this is a, just a different order of magnitude. Okay, Jim, I, I understand exactly what you're saying about a nuclear attack. My point is, with my question is, what should the United States be doing right now to prevent the nuclear buildup that we know is taking place in North Korea? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, well, that's, that's the, the point of my question. question. You know, there, we're at, right now we're in a hopeful phase because things have paused because of the Olympics. Maybe that will carry momentum forward, maybe not. But the biggest way to protect ourselves is to make sure that we freeze North Korea's program so it doesn't grow any larger, it's not, you know, and, and, and more accurate and sophisticated, and then begin a process of trying to put constraints and rolling it back. But job one is to pause and then freeze uh, and then try to put this on a different track. But, one, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, a lesson, it's, a, it's the lesson of the nuclear age that people find really, really hard to accept. For millennia, we always were able to rely on defenses. To protect ourselves. But in the nuclear age, the weapons are so powerful, you have to use other ways. You have to use deterrence and you have to use diplomacy uh, because there is no defense. So has today's false alarm enlightened us 
about the seriousness of any potential threat from North Korea, or for that matter, any other rogue nation that would seek to do us harm uh, via a nuclear attack or yeah, I think terrorism, that's a great for that question. matter. And I, I hope more people, more journalists ask that question, because there should be a conversation about what this really means. And it's sort of, Kelly, you know, indirectly and surprisingly, it, it ties to that other st story over the weekend of the CDC canceling mm -hmm. its mm -hmm. course or its workshop on, uh, you know, how to uh, prepare for a nuclear attack. That turned out to be controversial, and it's sort of all tied to the same subject. And I think we as Americans, you know, since the end of the Cold War, we've sort of forgotten and very few people left from Nagasaki and Hiroshima. We've sort of forgotten yeah. what the real meaning of nuclear weapons is and how, how fearful uh, it can be. So I think that if, if, if there's any good that comes from this false alarm, it would be that we can begin to have a real discussion about that. All right, Jim, we'll end it there. And the discussion, no doubt, is going to continue. Jim Walsh, thank you. Thank and you. As, as we continue to follow this developing situation out of Hawaii, we will be talking with more lawmakers, with members of the military, with witnesses. Uh, again, if you're just joining us, uh, the people of Hawaii, those visiting Hawaii, received a false alarm on their phones today that an incoming missile was about to strike to take cover the original message, this is not a drill. We have now learned that somebody hit a wrong button, as it is being called, and that alert went out to everyone's phones. That was not supposed to happen. But, of course, you can imagine the panic that ensued uh, all over Hawaii. People are, are tweeting about what it was like, real fear, real terror, today in Hawaii as we try to get down to the bottom of exactly who hit that button, why it happened, how it could have happened. We will continue to follow this here on Fox News. Stay with us. This is a Fox News alert as we continue to bring you the very latest developments out of Hawaii today. We all got the, got the notification that the people in Hawaii, both living and visiting, received this alert on their phones. The emergency officials had sent out a ballistic missile alert, um, went out accidentally. It was a mistake. It was an error. We want to bring in Peter Brooks with the Heritage Foundation, senior fellow and former deputy assistant <coughs> secretary of defense, joining us on the phone, uh, you know, as we've been going over this as it all unfolds and trying to get down to the bottom of what happened, how it happened, um, and just thinking about the people on Hawaii right now who had to live through this. That alert goes out, and it, not until 35 minutes or so was it corrected, and they found out that it was a false alarm. So first, let me just ask you, sir, what, you, what your initial reaction was when you heard that this had gone down. Well, I guess the good news is that it was a false alarm, although they're going to, the Hawaiians are going to have to dig into this and find out what happened, because uh, this could have caused a tremendous amount of trouble. But the, the bad news is that there is a real threat. Uh, there is a threat from North Korean missiles, and it is certainly a, a possibility. I don't think it's imminent, uh, but it is within the realm of possibilities and something we need to be concerned about. I'm also glad to hear that they do have our taking steps outside of this false alarm to, to be prepared. Uh, in case, because uh, places like Guam and Hawaii are within the threat ring of, of North Korean missiles, as is the United States now. Uh, there are big questions about their capabilities. Uh, they seem to be able to send a, a, a intercontinental ballistic missile to long ranges. There are questions about the warhead reliability, their accuracy, and, and the reliability of their missile force in, in general. But, uh, yeah, there's a real threat out there right now. And, you know, a lot of people are saying this is not only a wake-up call to the entire situation as a whole, but a wake-up call uh, to the preparedness. And, and we're now hearing stories of people hiding in bathtubs, putting mattresses over their bodies. Uh, we're even getting one report that we're working to verify that people were starting to look at storm drains as a possibility to hide their children. Um, I mean, you, you, they don't seem to have a huge plan, um, even on the state's own website of emergency preparedness, it, the idea is to lay flat on the ground and stay away from the window. Um, so when you think about that and you think about the reality that we're in right now with North Korea, yeah. um, you look at that and you think, okay, this is a wake-up call. What more needs to be done? What do you think? Right. 
Well, I think there will be a lot of lessons learned from this. Like I said, it's, it's terribly concerning that this happened. they got to make sure that their systems are not hackable, for instance. I mean, was this right by an outside individual that sent out that sent out this uh, this alarm or was it somebody inside the government and it was just a mistake i mean they're going to have to run this to ground and find out what the story is re- regarding that but and hopefully and i'm sure they will uh they will take lessons learned they'll right. you know do a, a, a good investigation of this and figure it out they'll also look at their preparedness and the preparedness of the not only of the government uh but of the of the people as well so from this terrible uh, story uh hopefully uh, and this terrible fright to the hawaiian people Hopefully, something will be learned, and it, it should apply to others as well. And, and Peter, uh, you know, I want to—I uh, I also want to tell you really quick that we have learned it was uh, somebody that hit a wrong button. Somebody's in a control oh. room somewhere, and a button was hit by mistake. So, you know, you can't help but wonder: should there be just one person? who is in charge of that one button, you know, you imagine what you see um, sometimes in the movies, uh, you know, that maybe there should be a couple of people in charge of something that is so drastic. So if you're going to hit a button, it's going to go to everybody's phones. Uh, Maybe they were, uh, as it's been indicated, maybe they were about to have some kind of a state exercise uh, that wasn't supposed to go out to everyone. Maybe they were doing something internally. Uh, But the idea that maybe just one person hit one button and then all of this happened, and here we are today uh, looking at your screen now this is what went out on people's phones uh incredibly scary what type of precaution should happen now to make sure you know obviously it should be maybe a a two-person system if it's not now Uh, but is that surprising to you that it was one person that hit one button yeah i guess it is uh but once again like they're going to have to employ best practices as well as uh, lessons learned here you know take a look do a good investigation figure out what happened and then make adjustments to it uh, to make sure that something like this doesn't doesn't happen again. But then once again, if there is a real threat, they also have to be ready to, for, uh, to be able to put out that sort of information. Uh, they'll want to know how many people got this information, uh, even though it was false in this case, to see if they could get it out better. Are the Hawaiian people uh, knowledgeable enough about what sort of precautions to take? And this doesn't apply to Hawaii. Uh, we are within that threat ring as, as well. I mean, we have defenses. We have missile defenses. We would be aware of strategic warning if we were moving in the direction of, of conflict. Uh, we have capabilities to, to shoot down uh, these missiles. Uh, there are questions about the North Korean nuclear capabilities. But once again, I think there's a lot to be to be learned here out of this uh, terrible out of this terrible story. And and to be clear too, there I mean there have been false alarms before of this nature. Not maybe not on the public system. We were looking back um, over the files. You know, November of 1979, computers at North American Aerospace Aerospace Defense Command uh, and many others uh, showed that a massive Soviet nuclear strike was coming, and people were scrambled. And then it also happened again in June of 1980, where U.S. command posts received received another warning that a Soviet Union uh, missile was coming. That was a false alarm. Now, of course, we didn't have the smartphones back then. False alarms have happened in the past. Lessons have been learned. This is a it's a different age. It's a different time. And hope Hopefully we will get to the bottom of it, and uh, we're, we're getting messages from our producers on Capitol Hill, Chad Pergram specifically. Lawmakers want to know um, how the mistake happened, ranging from, you know, the state alert systems all the way to telecoms and who pushes out those alerts. So as we continue to follow the situation, we thank you for your time and joining us today, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, we continue to follow the developments of this breaking news story. And when we return, we will have more as we move forward to find out how all of this transpired in Hawaii. A false alarm, we're grateful to say, but certainly a lot of alarm about what to do for preparation. All right, we're going to go to Brian Yenis right now, who's been following this story for us today. And Brian, before uh, you start your story, I just have to quote this from my dear friend Mike Leonel, who lives in Hawaii. And he says, I moved my family to Hawaii almost, six, Hawaii almost six years ago, just went through this crazy false warning. Now, the reason why I bring up Michael is that that would be his response. Michael is an excellent film uh, maker who survived. Uh, Mount St. Helens, the eruption of that volcano many years ago. So Mike is a stalwart kind of guy protecting his family. But nevertheless, he acknowledges the fact that he just went through this crazy false alarm. I mean, this is something that uh, you, you think about, you hear about when you're, when you're thinking about the North Korean threat as a, maybe a possibility. But there is nowhere else in this country other than Hawaii, really, that faces this real threat. And obviously today, 
an unfortunate reminder for so many on that island. We've even gotten more tweets. We'll actually bring up a tweet right now from Sydney Ember, who just tweeted, people were sheltering in the basement. People were crying and holding each other. It was actually scary for a few minutes. And I think we have to go back to the few minutes thing. It was 38 minutes between when that first message was sent out, that alert was sent out, and when the correction was sent out. The Hawaii Emergency Management Agency says it's going to take, it takes 20 minutes from a launch potentially from North Korea to reach Hawaii. And people have less than 10 minutes to actually take action. This is actually from the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. This is the plan if and when uh, a, if a ballistic missile were to ever launch from, a, say, a North Korea. The U.S. Pacific Command in Hawaii alerts the emergency management services in the state. Then in the first five minutes, it's all about the detecting of the, the detection of the launch, uh, whether or not we can stop that missile with our missile defenses, and then notifications to the state are brought up. If we can bring that up one more time, guys. And then after that, the sirens are brought up in the first in the next five minutes. And then there's the emergency advisory alerts that we people were getting on their phones and TVs. And then people have 10 minutes for individual action. Again, this is underscoring the point here about what the plan is in the case of something like this. Obviously, given the, the tensions with North Korea, a very real threat. And they're told that people have to either get inside, stay inside, or and stay tuned. That is the plan for people in Hawaii. That is, there are no designated blast or fallout shelters in the state. People have 10 minutes to make a decision as to what to do. Again, it's just underscoring the point here that not only do people have to relook uh, this step, obviously somebody hit a wrong button, maybe there should be at least two people in that, but they also have to re-engage with the public here who have lost trust, perhaps given obviously this false alarm for 38 minutes, and then re-educating people as to what to do. People here on the East Coast, you think about it, perhaps living in New York City, there's always a threat of a terror attack, but to live in Hawaii and to be on the threat of a missile landing within 20 minutes and being told that your only option is to run indoors or to stay lay out, lie on the ground, a very unsettling reminder of uh, the threat, a real threat that exists. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more conversation moving forward as to uh, what needs to be done here, because right now there is no federal funding for those fallout shelters oh, and you whatnot. Bet. You bet there's going to be a lot of discussion after this. False alarm uh, or not, there will be a lot of discussion about that, because there's one angry congresswoman out there who's uh, making a beeline to Washington. You can be sure she'll be pushing for uh, some forward action on this so that there's more, uh, more of a proaction. And, and, and it's, it's really kind of bizarre, Brian. It was just a shift change. And in that shift change, that one quick moment, someone pushed the wrong button, yet look how long it took to warn everybody this is a false alarm. Right. right. And I, I think it's also important to reiterate that Hawaii has just begun be using their, uh, testing their sirens for the first time, the first state to do so since the Cold War. And they just started out with that process as well. And that's a two-minute test that happens. Um, it's, they're planning on doing this now at the start of every month at 1145 in the morning. Uh, but again, this is all very new to people. I think many more people are going to be, uh, uh, well, they're going to be interested in these tests moving forward. But Absolutely. again, uh, th there needs to be more double checks and rechecking of, of how this process is set because it is a frightening proposition that people only have 10 minutes to react. And today, for many people, they thought it was the real thing. And 38 minutes went by um, with uncertainty. So, All right, tough. Brian Yenis, yeah. thanks for the update. Of course. All right, Laura. And, of course, some of those heartbreaking moments of people trying to reach their family on the mainland to call and, you know, say something is about to happen. So as we move through this afternoon here and, and figure out, you know, getting to the bottom of exactly what happened, um, the Hawaiian governor, David Ige, did come out and say it was the wrong button that was pushed somewhere in a control room. Listen. Uh, it was uh, a procedure uh, that occurs at the change of shift where they go through to make sure that um, the system is working and uh, an employee pushed the wrong button. It came down so, to a person pushing the wrong button. Who is yes. that person? Well, it's one of our, it's, it's my responsibility, so this would be my fault. The whole purpose of this is that the change of shift briefing is for each shift to understand what is the process. Uh, we'll take action to, do, to prevent this from ever happening again by having more than one person there to do this, make this decision, or we'll work on equipment changes. But again, let me finish the investigation. This is off my fault, and we'll work on so that this doesn't have, ever happen again. 
And there you have it. We are getting another player involved there, uh, hearing that, you know, taking responsibility, uh, somebody there at the state level uh, coming in and talking about exactly what happened. Well, let's bring in Jonathan Wachtel once again, our former communication director over at the U.S. mission to the U.N., a friend of Fox News. Uh, Jonathan, as you hear that sound bite, and you now, we're now hearing the explanation, the officials coming forward, and, and that's always what we want to hear, right? If, the, if a mistake could happen, we want people to come up and take accountability. So here we have it, but now we have to digest that information of exactly what happened, that it was a wrong button, that it was a shift change thing. Um, your reaction to this latest news? Well, first of all, kudos to that gentleman who admitted uh, fault here. I mean, that's obviously a very difficult thing to right. do, given the circumstances. Uh, you know, we'll see how this all shakes out and how he's affected by this. But uh, obviously, he's trying to do the correct thing and trying to get at least to the you know, the proof of what happened, what, what transpired here so that uh, people can analyze this and try to figure out how to avoid uh, such a calamity in the future. Uh, and, you know, the word calamity is obviously a, a word that can mean many things. In this case, thank goodness, we have not had a catastrophe. Um, and uh, we can work within this system to try to fix this. Um, the governor, you know, also saying that, uh, you know, this is a state of Hawaii uh, issue. This was not a federal government problem also, taking it on the chin, and obviously he'll be working very hard to try to fix this problem. Um, look, overall, this is a great wake-up call for all Americans, uh, and uh, it's, it's a wake-up call that the Japanese have been dealing with ever since uh, Kim Jong-un has ordered these intercontinental ballistic missile fires over her over Japan and they've fallen into the sea of Japan and scared the bejeebies out of <laughs> poor fishermen out there trying to catch, uh, you know, whatever they are out there with their nets trying to go about their business and, and worry that there's going to be a missile falling on their head. Right. Uh, these are real problems and it needs to be addressed and there's a certain level of maturity that we have to have in our country in terms of preparedness anywhere within the United States. Uh, you know, we grew up, Laura, you know, in a time of the Cold War, and we remember those, uh, those alarms that used to go off, and, and, you know, it was probably a helpless uh, type of thing that we were trained to do as children, to go and hide under our desks or behind, you know, uh, fences and walls and something like that. But there are uh, real things that can happen that emergency management can guide our population into making sure that we have the safeguards to at least protect ourselves and, and to be able to respond if something should happen, if our in infrastructure is affected, things that we can do as citizens to ensure that there's less chaos and we can cope with whatever has transpired. Right. And we probably all know somebody in our lives, uh, I know that I do uh, here in New York, that people that have go bags, people that have their plans in place, and some people look at them and say, you really need that go bag? Is that really going to help you? Are you going to be able to get out of New York City if something were to occur? But, but a plan is important. Those go bags to many are very important. And, and I want to go back to something that you said about those ballistic missiles uh, going out over the ocean because I, I want to bring up the fact that North Korea has conducted three tests of ballistic missiles capable of hitting Hawaii. This I know you know, but uh, to go over the dates, July 4th of 2017, it flew 40 minutes landed in the Sea of Japan. July 28, 2017, flew 47 minutes, also landed in the Sea of Japan. And then on November 28th of last year, a ballistic missile, missile was launched, went 53 minutes in the air, and it landed in the Pacific Ocean. So as you mentioned the fact that these are real, very real threats, uh, and, and you've got it here with the history, and you've got it now with what has just happened. Um, we want people to be prepared, and we want to hear more um, from emergency management officials in Hawaii, especially after this, Jonathan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in the coming days, there'll be obviously a thorough investigation, and the governor and uh, the congresswoman who've been uh, on the channel today, they'll, of course, have updates on what they're doing for their citizens. But this is not just a Hawaiian problem. Right. I mean, obviously, they feel uh, they're closer to North Korea. They're closer within range. They, the, the chances of them getting hit or Guam, as you recall a few months ago, the panic that was taking place in Guam, in which uh, Kim Jong-un was threatening to, to unleash, uh, you know, a nuclear attack on Guam. These 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 poor islands, which which, by the way, I mean, you know, it's been decades since World War Two, but they actually have felt conflict. They they you know, they they were, you know, Pearl Harbor 
maybe decades ago, but it's felt. If you go to Hawaii right. as you have gone, you know, it, this is part of, you know, not so recent history, but it's, it's part of the DNA of, of the Hawaiian people. They remember it well. That's right. And you bring up a very valid point. Jonathan, I want to thank you for your time, your expertise. We'll continue to check back in with you as we move through this developing story. Thank you. Jonathan Wachtel. Kelly. So on the phone with us now is Colton Yamaguchi, uh, resident of Hawaii. And uh, Colton, uh, obviously you went through this situation this morning. Tell us what it was like for you for your morning as you awakened to this alarm. Absolutely. So I was on my way over across the island, um, driving across, and um, basically we, we pulled over on the side of the road to um, go to a restaurant. And m the rest of my family just got this notification about you know, ballistic missile, and I, I was just kind of confused because I didn't get a, I didn't get a notification at all, and I still have a Hawaii area code and everything, and you know, it was breaking into chaos, and and I have a younger brother. My mom was kind of freaking out, so my dad and I were trying to calm the family, and and we knew this was a very real threat, and uh, we we're just trying to trying to keep everyone calm, but it was it was chaotic. Chaotic indeed, and what did you say or do to try to help calm the fears of your family and that in the midst of that chaos? Well, you know, I, I know that there was a military base within a mile from us, and, and um, I just tried to keep everything nice and orderly and, and just assured them that, hey, at least, at least we're together right now. Um, luckily, I didn't have any friends um, out in the ocean or anything. I didn't have any family out in the ocean. So um, the fact that we were all together and we were going to head to a shelter together was, was very calming, and I tried to talk to those, towards those points. You know, Colton, uh, some people can be very uh, cynical and callous in, in this life that we live, and they could be looking at the situation and say, I was just a false alarm, you know, get over it. But I'd like you to express to them why it's more than just a false alarm for those who are living in Hawaii. Oh, it's absolutely more than a false alarm, and that's just because um, now it's, it's more of a wake-up call, you know. It's, mm -hmm. it's, there's a lot of people that, you know, laugh at people that have plans and that have, you know, some sort of route to actually execute where they're going to go and take shelter. And those people that we're laughing are now that we're just freaking out, they're now taking it a lot more seriously and they're actually creating a plan themselves. So it's a, it's a really good wake up call. Yeah, a wake up call. Despite all of this. And, and I, I'm just curious to know the, the fact that it was a false alarm, that it was uh, an accident, it was human error. What, sure. what feelings do you have towards those who committed that error uh, in particular? Well, you know, the, the state has released a little statement on how it happened and how it was, it was during a, a shift change when, when workers were swapping shifts and whatnot. And the fact that it could happen so easily is a little ridiculous to me. And I think the state definitely has to take some steps to, to prevent that from ever happening again. That type As, of stress and unnecessary stress is ridiculous. Yeah, and, and to, to your point, there was a gentleman there standing next to the governor. We didn't get his name, but... I was very impressed with the fact that he took full responsibility and sure. accountability for saying it's my mistake. Uh, I hate to say it, but that seems to be rare for government officials to come out and say, okay, it happened on my watch, it's my fault, and sure. we will do everything we can to address this to ensure that it doesn't happen again. I, I think one has to give kudos to someone like Absolutely. that trying to be transparent uh, with his citizens. Absolutely. You have to give a lot of respect toward that. And someone to take responsibility like that is uncommon. And, um, you know, I, I just have a lot of respect for that move right there. Colton, uh, your family now, what are you going to do for the rest of the day now that's a false alarm? You're trying to get back to normal. What does normal look like <laughs> after something like this? Sure. So, um, like I said, I have my younger brother, and we were on the road. We were actually driving to a baseball tournament. So the tournament got delayed just a bit, um, but we're all here now. The game's going. Um, people are trying to, you know, keep it calm for the kids and whatnot, but um, our hearts are still beating a little bit. Uh, beating a little bit, but uh, hopefully you'll be yelling a little bit after you as you get under that, uh, underway with that tournament, and I, I, hope, uh, I hope your team wins. Colton Yamaguchi, thank you. thanks for being a great thank American man. All right, thank you. And as we watch the situation, listen to the situation.
Situation unfold in Hawaii, uh, Kelly. One thing that I want to bring up that I just got an email on uh, one resident, Alex Michaels, has texted somebody here on our staff saying, "Not everyone got the first warning. The message, that message, including me, I only got the false alarm report. So, is yeah. there a potential issue with the alarm system, the alert system in Alex general?" Alex talked to us earlier, as a matter of fact. That, right. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. So, I I'm mean, as we that out. we'll continue to follow this. Uh, stay with us here on Fox News as we watch what's happening in Hawaii today. This is a Fox News alert. We are continuing to monitor the situation out of Hawaii, where a short time ago we had a false alarm that went out to cell phones all across Hawaii, both to residents, people visiting, that there was an incoming ballistic missile, that it was not a drill. We later found out 30 minutes later that it was a false alarm. We want to play you some sound we just got from someone staying at a hotel. Well, anyway, guys, we have a threat, a uh, ballistic missile threat in Hawaii, and um, I don't know what's going to happen. A lot of people, you know, receiving the text messages about ballistic missile threat. So, uh, I mean, hopefully it's not going to hit our hotel, man, because it's going to be sucks. Yeah. It's a, it's a threat, guys. It's a threat. Uh, alarms going off. As you can see, there's not many people on the streets anymore. Uh, look at the people. Look at the people. People are just sitting there, standing there and waiting. Almost barely anybody driving right now. But yeah, it's kind of crazy, guys. Let's see what's going to happen. And that's exactly what people do, right? They grab their cell phones, go to the balconies, go to the windows, and uh, see what's happening. Let's go to Phil Keating, who's live from West Palm Beach, where the president is spending the weekend. See what's happening there. Hi, Phil. Hello. The president is at Mar-a-Lago, his winter White House on Palm Beach Island. He was actually at his golf international, uh, Trump International Golf Club this morning for about four, four and a half hours golfing, and he was. Not yet back to Mar-a-Lago when this first broke in the news about Hawaii's state office sending out this, what ended up being one of the worst false alarms you can possibly conceive of. We have now received a statement from a White House official. We have not received a tweet directly from the president himself on this issue, but let me read the statement. Quote, the president has been briefed on the state of Hawaii's emergency management exercise. This was purely a state exercise, emphasizing this was not a federal controlled issue. This was a state controlled issue. And the uh, United States Pacific Command, that command Commander David Benham also sent out a statement this morning. U.S. PATCOM has detected no ballistic missile threat to Hawaii. Earlier message was sent in error. The state of Hawaii will send out a correction message as soon as possible. By the way, that took about 20 to 38 minutes, 20 minutes by state, 38 minutes via the phone messages. And here's uh, what the phone notification originally, 8.07 a.m. Hawaii time, went to all kinds of phones out there, cell phones. Quote, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Again, 20 minutes later, a false alarm statement was mailed out or sent out. However, the follow-up cell phone message, which is what pretty much most of the people in Hawaii are relying on when it comes to emergency management operations, warnings and alerts. Uh, they didn't get it for a full 38 minutes. So you can imagine that's 38 minutes of panic, perhaps terror, and certainly about uh, just as much fear as you can imagine uh, being warned that potentially there's an intercontinental missile coming in with a nuclear tipped warhead uh, right towards your way. Not exactly the kind of false alarm anyone ever wants to send or receive. Uh, the governor of Hawaii also sent out a statement uh, today, David Ige, quote, while I am thankful this morning's alert was a false alarm, the public must have confidence in our emergency alert system. I am working to get to the bottom of this so that we can prevent this type of error in the future. And according to the governor, this was simply human error during a shift change. One of the departing employees accidentally pressed the wrong button, and that led to this 
false alarm and really a major, major scare in Hawaii, which has really been on edge ever since North Korean um, Supreme Commander Kim Jong-un began really frequently testing his missiles and threatening the United States with not only tough talk, but also uh, a lot of testing going on here. We also have this now in from the White House. The FCC is launching a full investigation into the false emergency alert that was sent to the residents of Hawaii. So the White House getting involved, uh, not the White House. Who is this from? Ajay Pai. Oh, he is with the Federal Communications Commission. My mistake. Uh, Federal Communications Commission also now investigating what exactly happened in Honolulu this morning and how that happened. And of course, the bottom line result that everybody wants is to make sure that no false alarm of this magnitude ever happens again. Back to you. All right, Phil Keating, uh, thank you so much. And of course, you know, a lot of lawmakers also chiming in today uh, saying that they want answers as well of how this happened, ranging from how the state alert system is being run uh, to how the telecoms are run, meaning who pushes that button, how it gets pushed out on those alerts. Uh, Phil Keating for us. Uh, thank you so much. Kelly. All right, as we continue to follow the developments of this story, you might imagine what tourists go through because, let's face it, Hawaii is one of the, prime, the premier tourist destinations. Everybody wants to go to Hawaii and spend a vacation time. Some people go there for weddings. It's a wedding destination. Uh, so you can imagine, as we saw from one person in the hotel there with his phone, the cell phone taking pictures of uh, people below, some of them sitting outside after receiving this information about a, a, a threat that was coming to their area and to take cover. He went to the top of, he went to the rooftop of the hotel to say, hey, I'm standing out here, not sure what's going on, but we've been told that we need to seek cover. Instead, he sought to tell the story, which uh, a lot of us who are uh, curious about things. We, we do that. And he shot some pictures and sent that back. And we were waiting for someone to talk to us from one of the hotels uh, via phone. But we seem to have lost that communication. But we will tell you, for those of you who have been watching us for the past two hours, uh, we came on at the top of the two o'clock hour with the breaking news story that people living in Hawaii had received the fright of their lifetime on their cell phones. Uh, when they received an alert. And, and some of us who are on the East Coast or anywhere in the United States, when we receive alerts on our phone, it could be a weather alert, it could be a missing persons alert, but there's that ping that happens. So if you can imagine, it's about 8 o'clock in the morning, you're in your bed, you're enjoying a Saturday, and you get this alert that says a ballistic missile is headed for you. This is not a drill. Take cover get shelter and so about 38 minutes transpire and you are responding trying to do whatever you can to make sure your loved ones are protected and and then you get the news that it's a false alarm and the military helped us out with this information giving us information that it was a false alarm and Lucas Tomlinson is one of our Pentagon producers and reporters. He joins us now from the Pentagon. And Lucas, we heard from you early on uh, after this third.